Welcome to Electron Online. Now that we've seen how the dispersion force is created, and namely by having an ion or some other outside force causing a temporary uh, molecule to become a temporary dipole, um, we want to take a close look and see how strong these dispersion forces really are. Normally, they're really, really weak. For example, in helium, and, and before I even go there, let's say, how do we even figure out how strong the dispersion forces are? Well, we can do so by taking a look at their melting and boiling points of the atoms or the molecules we're dealing with. Uh, for example, if, there's, if there are strong dispersion forces, then we expect high melting and boiling points. If there are low dispersion forces, we expect low melting and boiling points. And here we're talking about molecules that have no particular polarization to begin with. For example, helium. Helium is simply uh, a nucleus that's positively charged with two electrons, like so. And the electrons are equally distributed in the 1s orbital, and I should call it helium, not hydrogen. There we go. Um, and so therefore, we expect on their, on it, in and of themselves, they would have no dipole moment, and therefore, there would be virtually no intermolecular forces. And in the case of helium, that is true. And the dispersion forces are extremely weak, resulting in the lowest melting point of any substance in the universe, one degree Kelvin, and helium turns from a solid into a liquid. Now, for carbon tetrachloride, it's a very different story, and let's draw out the molecule to get a feel for what that is. So we have a carbon making four bonds with four chlorine atoms. Each of the chlorine atoms started out with uh, seven valence electrons. One is being used in the bonds. That leaves us with six valence electrons left over to make three unused electron pairs. Like so. And notice, because of the perfect symmetry, and of course this is, the, this is the lowest structure, the actual physical structure is the tetrahedral, but yet, with the tetrahedral, you have perfect symmetry, the carbon being exactly in the middle, and the four chlorines being the exact same distance away from the nucleus of the carbon. And therefore, we have no um, electrons that are in any specific place uh, away from the nucleus other than a complete symmetry all around the molecule, so therefore we would expect to see no polarization whatsoever on, uh, on this molecule. So in and of itself, it's not a polarized molecule. But the reason why there are what we call dispersion forces between the chlorine molecules, if you put a whole bunch of them together, is because when you place them together, these electrons are always not going to be in the exact same position like that. They're going to be whirling around, and there's going to be a variation in how the electron density uh, is distributed from one moment to the next. And these changes of the electron density pair with the fact that uh, carbon tetrachloride is a very large molecule in comparison to a helium atom. Uh, you can have situations where the, the electron density is uh, very much away from the total symmetry that, that you were expected to have. And so you have all these molecules, all these carbon tetrachloride molecules with electron distributions that are constantly changing, constantly varying around, so that there's a, on average, a polarity to each of these molecules that is fairly large. The polarity is such that the boiling and melting points are almost as high as the boiling and melting points of water. Notice uh, carbon tetrachloride has a melting point of 250 K, which is about 23 degrees centigrade below freezing for water, and 350 K for the boiling point, which is almost as high as the boiling point of water. So you see that the dispersion forces in the case of carbon tetrachloride are very, very strong because it's a fairly large molecule, and the ability to polarize molecules does depend almost entirely on the fact that there's a lot of electrons there and that the molecule is large. So lots of free electrons, large molecule, strong dispersion forces. Few electrons, small molecule, very weak dispersion forces. And just to give you a feel to compare that to, for example, uh, methyl fluoride, and let's draw out what methyl fluoride looks like. We have a carbon in the middle. We have three hydrogens bonded like this. And on one bond with the fluorine atom, of course, fluorine has seven valence electrons, one being used in the bond, six, free ele six uh, electrons in three uh, electron pairs that are unused right that. And notice that it's a fairly small molecule with just a few electrons. It is polar because there's more negative, um, more uh, charges on this side, less charge on this side. So this molecule is negatively charged on this side, 
positively charged on this side, so this is definitely a dipole. You would expect a dipole to have higher boiling and melting points than a, than a molecule that is not a dipole in and of itself, that is only polarized because of the dispersion forces. Um, or I shouldn't say, because of the movement of the electrons, the movement of the position of the electron clouds, you have a temporary polarization causing dispersion force. That's a better way to say it. And yet, a polarized molecule that has a very high dipole moment of 1.8 has a melting point at minus 142 degrees centigrade, which is 131 Kelvin, which is much lower than the melting point of carbon tetrachloride. So a dipole moment, a dipole molecule with a strong dipole moment having a lower melting temperature than a non-polarized molecule um, that has no dipole moment at all. So you can see that in this case the dispersion forces are actually larger than the dispersion forces, than, than the repelling forces here from the negative and the positive end of the molecule. So that's, um, that's actually very interesting and you can see that intermolecular forces are a lot more complicated than you would think. So what we tend to do then is we, you know, we take the the dipole-dipole forces and the ion-dipole forces and the dispersion forces all together saying there's a certain set of intermolecular forces which we call the van der Waals forces which cause these molecules to bond together to some extent and you can see that it's for various reasons and it all has to do with the interplay between the available electrons, the way they're distributed and the way they then become polarized either because of themselves or because of the induced polarization causing the atoms then to bond together to some extent and that then is determined then the, the determination is the boiling and melting point of these substances depending upon how strong those forces are. So oh, there's a good overview of those three forces and we'll take another look with some more videos on how to look at the van der Waals forces and one more force that we haven't considered yet.